And the last year of production, the fourth season, a person from the production office came up to me and said, you know, I've just seen the credits for, um, for uh, one of the episodes, and I had no idea that you did Pilot's voice. And I said, well, that's terrific. Great, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Took you long enough. Prepare for immediate starburst. Nothing can stop me from killing you. You stole my life! I was testing for Farscape for the best part of three months and I would pass this very tall gentleman in the corridor who was Anthony Simcoe. Anthony and I were actually testing for Dargo. The role that I was originally given to test for was Dargo and we got callbacks after callbacks. And then Rockney S.O. Bannon came across from the States on about the third or the fourth casting and Virginia Hay was there in that casting. And uh, he mentioned to us the concept of, at that stage it was called Space Chase. And I thought, my God, this sounds fantastic. And they'd already been in pre-production for five years, uh, working with the Henson Company. And I thought at that stage, you know, even if I got one day's work on it, or <laughs> one episode, it, was, it would be a fantastic project to be involved with. So we kept on testing. Um, Rockney went back and uh, a couple more tests. And then I got a call one Friday and my agency at the time said, well, I'm terribly sorry, but it's gone the other way. And I thought, well, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Uh, a few days later, I got another call <laughs> from my agency and um, the request at that time was to see whether how I would like to you know, work on this character, Captain Crace. And I thought, oh gosh, you know, great, I'll just go in and do an episode. They gave me the Bible and I flicked through it and I came across this whole section on Captain Crace. And I thought, oh my God, this person, sure, I'll, I'll sure as hell play him. So they offered me Captain Crace. And a few days afterwards, I offered Crace. The office again called and said, well, how would you like to test for this character, this creature called Pilot? And I said, sure. So I went into the studio and they sat me in front of a tape recorder and they said, play him like a harassed accountant. And let's, work, let's start from that beginning. And uh, so I kicked around for about half an hour, 40 minutes. And they said, thank you very much. And I walked out of there and the next thing is I got a call on that same day and they said, you've got Pilot as well. <laughs> So I was kind of doubly blessed. Do not fire until my signal. Peacekeeper ships in visual range. Moya senses they've targeted us. We don't have any choice to it now, Chris. Tell them, fire at will. And the funniest thing is, not many people knew I worked on Pilot's voice. Moya is returning to the asteroid field where she last saw Talon. What? There, you see? Is Moya unclear on the concept of why we ran away? She insists on searching for her offspring. For me, the challenge was to give him a kind of an accent away from Kreis and also find a different rhythm, because I think it's always really important that you find a different rhythm for if you're doing two, you know, if you're doing vocal work, voiceover work, and characterization, you've got to find a different rhythm from what you usually do. And uh, the writer's lines actually helped me a great deal in that. And I imagine him to be a little bit like uh, John Hurt, um, a British actor. So that's where I kind of got my original inspiration for him. Moya doesn't understand your distress. What really happens is I pitch it um, in a higher range. And all they do is put a light filter on it. Two, one. Weapons fire on board. Weapons fire. Originally, in the first season, um, I would be on set. And that, that was great for the other actors because they were getting a live performance. But because I was working uh, also on another set, you know, further around the corner on the lot, I, it wasn't practical for me to be there physically. So they then decided that it would be easier to actually shoot the, se shoot the episode and then have me come in a month and a half later in post-production and go into the studio 
and watch the rushes up there and uh, just voice it. So it would take anything from an hour to four hours to six hours. And, um, and then what also made it interesting was that I had to start, you know, um, revoicing Crace as well. Because the sets, you know, weren't, um, I mean, they, we were working in a tin shed, basically. When it rained, you couldn't hear anybody. So the rushes, when the rushes went to the States, <laughs> all you could hear was just the rain. And so we all had to go in and recreate our performances. Sometimes that was great, but other times it made our workload a lot heavier because, you know, especially in most of my episodes from season two and three, I, ended, I would end up screaming a lot in those episodes and I'd have to go in <laughs> and do the whole performance again. Um, and that was a real test for and a challenge for us as actors. But, um, you know, it actually meant that we could clean up some stuff as well. So I'd be in there in this dark little studio and just, you know, revoicing pilot stuff and, uh, and it was fun. I wish sometimes it would be that audiences could actually see what we would do as actors. Uh, you know, if there was a dark glass wall that you could actually see what actors do and the process they go through. It's quite, it's, it's very funny because you're only working with a microphone and I'm really animated in there when I'm working with pilot. Ships approaching! Peacekeeper ships! I would always try and imagine John Hurt's voice. And when I was traveling into the studio, you know, I'd just do some vocal warm-ups at home before I got into the car. And then I would kind of locate his voice in my head. And then I'd be ready and then I'd go in. Now the interesting part, and so it wouldn't take me long to find Pilot's voice. What I did find interesting once was I was doing Crace first and then I ended up doing Pilot second. And I realized my voice had actually dropped uh, a note and sometimes a note and a half. So I realized then what I had to do was if I had both roles to voice, I'd have to go in and do Pilot's voice first. We may never see any of you again. Pilot, just be ready to starburst if you don't see us hauling ass toward you. You give him all you my love. And her love to you. Well, mine. His main task was to take care of Moya. And number one, take care of Moya. And number two, take care of the crew. He was kind of like a navigator. Nearing the origin of Talon's transmission, but there's no sign of Talon. He may have fled further into the field. What I would have liked to have included in there more is his backstory. I want to be joined so badly. I can make that happen, young one. But the elders. The Elders have not yet decreed it to be my destiny. I offer you the chance to make your destiny. Look up. And what do you see? Stars. That's what I offer you. Stars. I dream of nothing else. But, of course, with a 45-minute show, you're really packing in a lot of information. Crace, on the other hand, his journey and where his kind of involvement, um, I mean, you know where we started, being this cranky, I, I always call him Captain Cranky. Talvo is dead, struck down by a weak, pathetic, inferior being. It must be avenged! I swear in Talvo's name, Crichton, you will die in my hands. He wasn't bitter and twisted, but he was certainly on a revenge for trail for his brother uh, being killed by Crichton. But after that journey kind of petered out, what was interesting then was the relationship he had with Crichton. You know, they would have been great mates, of course, it never kind of this happened that way. And I think it was for a very good reason that it didn't happen that way, because if you don't have kind of a friction in the show, then you don't have, you don't have a show. I don't like this plan and I never will. So you better behave yourself with Talon and Aaron. 
Because if you hurt either one of them... I'm going to hunt you down. You hunt me down. <laughs> that would complete the symmetry nicely, wouldn't it? I think one of the, the, the nice elements, or the great element about Farscape, as opposed to any other science fiction show, if we've left a stamp anywhere, is we've left a stamp, we've taken a kind of a clean kind of show that Star Trek is, twisted around, twisted it inside out, and, you know, and made it dirty, you know, muddied it up, and, uh, and also realized that really it was a ship full of misfits. Grace, come here. Why? Closer. This is secret. If you try anything, closer. If you don't have misfits that are always constantly at each other's throats, then you don't have friction, and therefore you don't have drama. Don't Name. It's, uh, John Crichton. And where are you from? John Crichton. Sir, he claims to be a human from a planet called Earth, but he's shown himself to be... To be what, Officer Sun? A clever imposter, an accomplice to a ship full of escaping prisoners, my brother's murderer. It's been a wonderful journey working on Captain Crace. The one promise I made to myself was that I would not make him a one-dimensional character. I would make him as complex and as passionate as I could, given the confines. And uh, the wonderful part about that is I think all the writers kind of saw what I was doing and added to that, you know, and uh, he became a very complex character. And, and I think, one, for me, one of the uh, kind of greatest roles I've played to date. The thing about Kreis is that whenever he was quiet, that's when, as an audience, you've got to start worrying because you never knew what the heck he was going to you know, do next. Talon? Intruder? And it was wonderful to play that. The, the, the whole thing for me, right from the beginning, was I was I wanted to be very, very physical with, with Kreis. No, I'm down! Down now! Power down now! My whole reason for doing that was so that when the moments were quiet, I could really just stop everything and just sit there in the scene, or not talk, or just look and just listen. Have you given any thought to my previous proposal? First up in the first season, um, and especially with the premiere, he's fairly one-dimensional. He's just a driven man. We are going after the Leviathan. But, sir, regulation... That is a direct order, Lieutenant. And you have no idea where he comes from and what his background is and what he's thinking. What began to change for me and or as the actor and also for the character is one scene at the end of season one where Crace is sitting down behind bars talking to there Crichton a in a hallway. Moya. Riding our ass. And then you get to see a little chink in there. I understand you didn't mean to kill my brother. It was an accident. I realize that now, as I look back and try to understand it all. Got any idea what you put me through? All of us through? I thought it was about my brother. It should have been about my brother. Somewhere along the way, my priorities decayed. I realized I'd become more concerned with my own image and career. It was a lovely scene because we're just sitting, looking at each other and just talking. And that moment for me, both as an actor and also shaping the character, that was the defining moment where you, we could actually begin to see into Grace. In season two and season three, you know, I start to have this relationship with, with Aaron Sun. I think she would have been his ideal partner in crime, you know, as it were. 
Don't forget I have to give Crichton a reason for my absence. He still has no knowledge of our arrangement? None. It might facilitate matters if you explain to him. No. Eventually, you'll have to. Only when it's too late for him to interfere. But I don't really think that he would have found love with her. Grace, we were going to share command of Talon. Chose otherwise. He needs both of us. No. We no longer need you. Talon can only have one, Master. You may return to Moya. I will not. She makes Grace understand about Talon. You can't command a Leviathan, you can only persuade. Talon is part Leviathan, part peacekeeper. He was designed to take orders. Why don't you let me talk to him? So it's kind of like you're prying open this, this clam and just prying it very, very gently. And the key to, to, to Kreis is Talon, but it happens through your own soon. And it's about allowing emotion to come in. He begins to think um, about other people. He begins to think of his relationship with this this hybrid ship, which is like, you know, begins to be like an errant kid. There's no reason to be afraid. I'm here. So is Grace. Talon, we want to help you, please. So in a way, he kind of did find a love, a father, kind of son relationship, um, and a reverend son, but the son Nevertheless. This is how the peacekeepers treat their own. You, me, Officer Sun. But we are alike now. Orphaned from all we ever knew. We have only one another to rely upon. If Christ had a fault in there, he was probably blinded by revenge. I am here, Crichton. To talk. To kill you. As we know in human beings, it's a passion that can just drive you, you know, mad. And you can't see clearly, you can't think clearly. If anything, it clouded his logic. You think I attacked your brother? Oh, yeah. I popped into the middle of a giant space battle and decided to go one-on-one -on -one with a total stranger in a far superior ship. Does that make any sense? You rammed his prowl! You ran into me! You killed him! It was an accident! Why do you keep blaming me? I did everything I could to avoid him! Chris hated the fact that, uh... Scorpy put him in the Aurora chair. Who is that? <laughs> My father. Turn it off! Don't you like your past, Chris? Turn it off! The Aurora chair was not a good experience for him. And actually, it was very funny. The day that I actually sat in the Aurora chair, I had this, this idea that if you could be burnt by napalm, that would be the level of pain. So that's what I was thinking about as an actor. And I put myself on that course, and, uh, and uh, when, when we rolled camera, uh, I just let it go. And what happened was, on the third revolution, all the lights blew, <laughs> and the whole studio went boom, and, um, and that was an amazing moment, actually, I'll never forget. <laughs> Listen, we are all on the same team, we all want this ship destroyed. And the only way to do that is with Talon. Grace is proposing that he and Talon starburst while still inside the command carrier hangar. The carrier will collapse upon itself. Outer decks first. Central core last. Where do we meet up with you and Talon? You don't. Starburst in a confined space where the energy can't dissipate. It will be the hero's death that Talon deserves. The great payoff at the end of uh, season three, where I stand there in Talon and I say, Starburst. That moment where I'm going, I'm right deep in your heart, right in, the, in your center right now, to uh, Scorpius, and Scorpius knows exactly what's about to happen. And that for me, um, in terms of 
you know, playing Kreis as the actor and also the, re the full evolution of his arc for me was a great joy. That moment I'll never forget. And so there was the payoff in terms of revenge. <laughs> it took a long while to get there, but it worked. Talon, the firing mechanism on your cannon was taken from you by the peacekeepers. The rest have been captured. And Moya, Moya will soon be enslaved unless we do something. Something radical. Scorpius. I am just making my final goodbyes. Where are you, Grace? I am standing in your heart. And I am about to squeeze. It was an amazing moment because I knew it was the, my last you day of work. To be one. And so uh, when I walked into the set that morning, that very morning, it was, it was amazing because the whole crew kind of knew that it was you the end as well. That situation. You took away my command. You stole my life from me. All this time, Scorpius. I am not leaving quietly. Somebody find that fool and get him out of that ship. <laughs> I suggest you hang on to something. I'm very happy with, with that scene, knowing that there was no other choice and that's the only way that he could do it. And it was a brilliant move. I think he did it for the, for the greater good, which was not really what you see of him when you first meet Grace. Tell him. Starburst. By the end of you know um, the third season, you see this whole man, and it's wonderful having people come up to me and say, you know, I really, really hated you, <laughs> but then you know you did something, and I hated you for that as well, you know, <clears throat> because it made me feel for you, you know. So I said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, Dan. I promise you that I will do everything I can, and Crichton and Aaron will as well. We are all here with you. You have not disappointed me. On the contrary, Talon.